You're listening to the Ringside Podcast. Welcome to Ringside. The show that brings you all that is pro wrestling news, interviews, and opinions. Mama, mama, Really? Woo! We got two words for ya! Oh, yeah! With Daniel Spencer. Acknowledge me. Jeremy Woman. When my hand goes up, your mouth goes shut. And Linda Kay. Are you boys ready for the grind? And now, let's ring the bell and start the show. Welcome to the Ringside Podcast. I'm Daniel Spencer. I'm Jeremy Wallman. I'm Linda Kay. All right. Uh, look at this. We have this is three shows in a row that Linda is here, and she's it's not, it's not even like a new thing now. She's like she's like it. She's like in in like Flynn, right? Fully invested. Fully invested. How, Linda has no. Just chill. fully vested, not fully invested. Fully invested. <laughs> oh, fully vested. Okay, gotcha. Linda, how's it? How? What's the feedback you've had? I, I know you know um, people have uh, you know been listening and whatnot. We have some great, uh, especially the last episode with a uh, bonus episode with Rhea Blipperly had a lot of a uh, uh, lot of listens on that. What's the feedback you've heard from anybody that has listened to the shows? It's been great feedback. Uh, a lot of my friends have tuned in and knowing that we have uh, produced and released some episodes um, as of late. So um, it's been very exciting uh, for them, of course, for me as well. But also just getting those huge interviews to really help, you know, kick things off since we're steadily doing the shows again. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and, and, and you know, I told you... Um, uh, we kind of in a private chat. We have a couple of guests lined up with ideas what we're going to do. But here coming soon, we do something every year um, that I can't wait to do. And there's our our yearly ringside review, uh, and that is where we're going to have different. Uh, and and I'll if you haven't listened to it before from the years past, I'll I'll, I'll uh, kind of go over when we get to that point. We'll have categories of you know, wrestler of the year, female wrestler of the year, match of the year, those kind of things we, we do. We do some, some off the walls. Then we also do an OVW flavored one, just OVW alone mm-hmm. um, that we pick. Which your wrestler of the year could be your OVW wrestler of the year and your wrestler of the year for the for yeah. each, uh, for each one. So it could happen technically if they, they're the best um, there is. So, um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that was a, did you catch that? that was a, yeah. Anyways, yes. Um, yeah, so that's that's exciting. That'll be coming up at the end of the year. We'll do that uh, right before the holidays. We'll 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 record that and get that out there. And um, I know already. I, I've already in my mind know what matches of the match of the years I'm like going to be picking from because it's just been amazing, especially here recently on everything. Um, but uh, <coughs> yeah, some exciting things coming up and uh, a couple of guests we got lined up for the end of the year. Like I said that and then. And then we're going to start off the the uh, new year with a bang too. So just we're going to keep keep pushing along this uh, this train, um, you know for sure. Jeremy, yeah, no, I'm I'm loving getting back into this. Uh, you know, we we all had some the pandemic really dampened things for everybody across all fronts. So ever since that hit, we kind of slowed down production. Um, well, what's cool a, about it? Though? A lot. So I'm I'm glad that, that we're getting back into the swing of things and 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 getting more quality content. I'm glad we've upgraded at the co-host row. Now I hope we can upgrade at the host row, and this will be a one big five star show. Oh boy. Um, I mean, look, we there was a while there we were we we did have an upgrade. Uh, we Jeremy wasn't the co-host for a while. He took a he took a break. It was it was a great time. Uh, Wait a in, minute. In our, in our era. <laughs> <laughs> that was a sabbatical and it does not count i don't think anybody listened the weeks that i wasn't there <laughs> okay all right well, the listens were pretty reasonable um listen well so, they thought i was going to be on so that's why they never knew right it was always oh kitty pop on this time no actually <laughs> what, what weird about the pandemic and and linda before you came on it, of course we're 
now it works out that you know the pandemic kind of gave us this new way of doing things that um, we probably wouldn't have thought yeah. about this what uh, a couple years ago. But um, we, um, you know, back in the day, we would all get together in the studio. Like we would go to in the studio, and I love, I still love that atmosphere. And I hope you know when you're in town. Linda for OVW, maybe we can have an episode like that. Where we're all getting together and and, mm-hmm. and and doing it, but um, it was uh, it was cool there. And we were we had these ideas of going video video waves and all these different things we want to do. But the pandemic kind of opened up those doors. Or, you know, it was with Zoom meetings and everything. It kind of shows you how to how you're able to do things. But um, but yeah, so like I think if this if if we were in a situation needing a new co-host two years ago. I don't, which we kind of were, but I, but it like, like again, where we didn't have anybody to fill the shoes when JK left and we had Eric, if we, when Eric left, we didn't have anybody. I don't know what we would have thought about you because we would have been like, oh, well, we can't, she's in Milwaukee. Unfortunately, she's not in Louisville. We can't use her. Not, n- not realizing we could do it this way. Um, mm-hmm. So it's pretty cool to, to um, be able to be able to do it like this. And once we eventually launch our video pro- platform, which will be live, the idea is to be live every single week. And to have live interaction with the fans, and you know where you can even we can put chats up and things like that, little questions live, and maybe even you can pay a little extra to get your question read, you know those kind of things. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Why not? Uh, absolutely. And like you just said, when I am in town, I would love for us to get together and have that fun in studio vibe because there is definitely something special about that as well. Yeah, it's. I feel like we always had like there was always a great time we did when we did those, and sometimes you never expect we would have an idea of what we're going to talk about, but we just would, which we do this now even on here. But you could really never. I feel like we got we would get more heated in person than we would <laughs> on video um, through the through the uh, world of the internet. So, but again, the good thing about this is that we're able to like interview someone like today's guest, uh, uh, David Penzer. Um, you know, legendary ring announcer, currently still with Impact Wrestling, but goes all the way back to his WCW, back in the WCW days. Um, looks like he got a start as a ring announcer in 1988 for Global Wrestling Alliance in the South Florida area. Uh, but, um, yeah, WCW, then he was with TNA for many years. Um, up into, he came back a little bit with Impact, when it was Impact, as a, a couple stints, but then uh, in 2020, kind of, he actually, believe it or not, we, we'll share this uh, when he's on. But I, my first loop uh, with Impact Wrestling was in was right before the week before the pandemic. He was there too, being brought back for a TNA special. That's where we met, and then come to find out the pandemic happened, and we were still we mm-hmm. we got brought in to stay on board um, to me ref and him ringing out. So it's kind of like we got this um, kind of a bond there. Uh, together cool, cool. Uh, with that. So we'll definitely um, chat about that when he bring, comes on. But I'm excited about this because Pinzo is a great um, – he's a great friend of mine. We've, we've become very close. we become great drinking buddies, as we'll talk about uh, on the show. And, um, you know, uh, he's he's somebody that, uh, you know, he um, – I love hearing – he's got so many great stories. The first – one of the first things I knew when he found out that I'm – that I'm with Al – that I work with Al, Al Snow, he immediately goes – Oh, ask him about why he wouldn't sign the release in WCW for me. And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, just ask him about it. He'll tell you all about it. And um, I forgot forever. And then finally I remembered and asked him. And Al was like, Al told me the story. And it's pretty epic. And we'll bring it up when Pinzer's on. But and then, but Pinzer's side of the story and Al's side of the story are just funny hearing those two together. Um, <laughs> but um, but even Al goes to this day. He said he still never, never let that down, does he? And I go, well, I mean, that's 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 a funny story. It's a good story. Um, so why not? You know, why not? I would talk about it forever too. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is exciting to have him on. But but let's real quick before we get to him, let's kind of touch base on what's happened uh, in the world of professional wrestling for the last uh, week since we've been on. Um, you know, uh, we've uh, we had Raw live here in Louisville. Jeremy, I think you went. Oh my 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 kids went. Um, I did. I was there, live and in living color. Yeah. So, um, and then, uh, what did you? Uh, what What was your experiences you had there? Well, first off, uh, I noticed that neither of the two young women that we interviewed wrestled that night, so that was kind of disappointing. And you didn't see the one the entire night, uh, Miss Candice Loray. But um, and then in my, I got stuck behind. I actually. It was my brother, it was your brother-in-law-to-be, and it was my brother's boss from work, and it was me. And I 
I just happened to have a bunch of people that hadn't bathed in a couple of weeks sitting right around me and next to me, and it was just awful. Oh. It was horrific. Well, didn't expect that, but um, it was eight. It was eight different types of body body odor too. It was like armpits, breath, oh. butt cheeks, all of it. All right, guys. I'm let's... sorry that put a damper to your night, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah. It did it. I honestly, when when I was asked afterwards, I was like, well, that was the worst Raw of the Triple H era. And I don't know if it was because uh, of the bad experience I had all night or because I truly didn't believe it. Uh, it stood up to the, 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 you know, stood up to the test of the other ones. I, I just didn't think it was a very good Raw overall. I liked the main event. I liked the uh, Survivor Series, Women's Survivor, Survivor Series team reveal. But as far as everything else, I could have done without it. I, I, well, the Bobby stuff. Seth and Bobby are money anytime they're on the screen together. But for three hours, you're talking about, I enjoyed about 45 minutes of it. So one of the things that um, that my report back from, I mean, of course, my the kids loved it. They had a great time. It was a great thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, there was, there was a, and I'm going to say who they are, but there was an OVW guy there who's very involved in a lot of aspects of of ovw not just wrestles not just does other things but very 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 involved uh behind the scenes and they watched the show and they talked about how well things were put together from the standpoint of of the booking now this person also also does not currently watch wwe regularly at all believe it or not and I'm like, they, okay, well, then that probably did look like a five star event to him then, right? But hold, but this perspective though is interesting because this person knows the business very well and can put together matches and whatnot, but they don't watch it regularly. You know, watch the product regularly. They know who everybody is. They knew some of the stars a little bit, but they they don't know the ongoing story. But they were able to follow what's going on and the stories they told. And they said, and I said, I said so. I even mentioned them. I said, well, watching it, there's been better Raws in the past. I said, but this Raw was, it wasn't bad Raw. I don't, I, I, I don't think it was, I think it was a good Raw. I think there's been better Raws, but I think, I still think it overall was a good, good show. And they were like, oh, I thought it was a great show. They're like, it was like, there was also, he goes, I would, there was one thing I I kept thinking this is going to happen, this is going to happen. They did this. And then I now I understand why they, they made theory not go, you know, they thought theory was going to win clean. And then they realized, no, it was a referee stoppage, and he didn't really win. But then they understood why they did that. I was like, yeah, he goes, they had no, no idea that was going to happen. They didn't see that coming. And they were like, and I liked that. And I liked the, the layout. And I also understood the story about, between Mia Yim throughout the whole night. Mia Yim was involved in three separate different angle segments throughout yeah. the whole night. Yeah. But it all tied together to war games, you know, and, and um, when it all comes down to it. So. Um, with the Judgment Day, you know, with with um, the women and um, and then her her match, which also <coughs> was the Rhea problem. So um, yeah, I mean, I, it was very um, you know very very interesting to hear their take on it. So I, I I liked hearing stuff like that because it made me think, oh wow, this is um, you know this is definitely uh, um, interesting because you don't hear you don't usually hear this kind of a take from somebody. Well, that's that's exactly what me and Linda talked about, and you too last week. The unpredictability factor has increased exponentially on uh, WWE programming since Vince uh, said goodbye. So, if this was the first Raw that they had seen, l- l- let me go back and correct myself. I-, I do think that this was the worst Raw since Triple H took over, but I don't think it was a bad Raw. I just, uh, I just wasn't engaged the entire night and it could have had something to do with my in-person experience with, with the stank boy that was sitting beside me and behind me. So, but as far as the program, yeah, there, there, there was the matches. There was a bunch of, uh, even I think with Mustafa and Bobby, there were, there were some false finishes that made you think, Oh, maybe he might get them. Uh, so the stuff we brought up last week about what we enjoyed the most about WWE sounds like, yeah, he, that guy probably hasn't watched it in a while, and if this is his first post Vince Raw, it probably did seem exponentially better than uh, the past eight or nine. I mean, maybe even going back before uh, the Thunderdome. So well, yeah, I get that. I get rating, that. Ratings wise, it was up three percent from the week before. I mean, that's three percent. I know that's not a lot, but it but it's thousands of people. So it's up from three um, percent from the from the week before. 
Um, I will say this: I love the theory. Uh, the theory, theory did have a character change, a gear change, if you want to call it that. Um, and uh, you did see that uh, happen. And you also he did he did uh, explain his reasoning of what he did, which was exactly not to toot my own horn or anything. Was it, but just knowing wrestling, it was exactly kind of what I predicted or what I said. Like what his reasoning why he did it for the U.S. title, and he did it when he did it. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, maybe who knows? Maybe they didn't, maybe they listened to the show and been like, "Oh, that was a good idea," and they just wrote it down. You no, know, we we did. We <laughs> used to get regular listeners from Stanford, Connecticut, and we joked that it was Triple H and Stephanie, yeah. but I don't think it was a joke. I think oh, it was either. Well, I mean, I, I'm not saying that we haven't. There, if we look at the listens in the cities, I'm not saying Stanford, Connecticut is not on the list. I'm also not saying it's on the list. I'm just. <laughs> but you're right. We have had people <laughs> from Stanford, Connecticut listen before. You know, um, so. You know, it's happened. Um, Linda, your take on it? Yeah, I thought Rod did some business. We, we got to find out why exactly Austin Theory did do that cash in, and it really has helped elevate his character. Now, it is a character switch, but, you know, like a couple of me and my colleagues were debating, like, we were thinking maybe this is a way for to get the title off theory to get him down to NXT and help out um, those down at NXT in similar ways like how Apollo Cruz has gone down there, Dolph Ziggler when Natalia was down there. Or now we saw that it was to help elevate Change's character, elevate Austin Theory, and uh, we got to see just how vicious he can be. And you know, just him even talking in his way out, you know, like back to Gorilla saying, like, no one's on my level, which I think Roman Reigns says a lot, but just seeing that different demeanor was really great to see for Austin Theory and also as far as business getting us in a clear path to Survivor Series and to War Games as well. Yeah, 100%. And uh, and then let's, let's touch base a little bit on, on what happened on SmackDown. Phenomenal uh, opening match between mm-hmm. the Usos and the New Day. Um, and that, if you guys, if you're out there and you're a tag team or you want to understand tag team wrestling, uh, I can. There's many people to watch in the past, and I would highly recommend the Dudleys, the Hardys, the Edge and Christian. You know, not just your table, TLC matches, but just your general matches. I mean, the 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 Hollywood Blondes. We can go back to the the Freebirds. You can go back to the Heart Foundation, the LOD, Road Warriors, whatever you want to call them. You go all the way back to all these people. Uh, but if you want to see modern day tag team done in its finest, with all the high spots and all the super kicks and all the stuff, check out. The New Day and the Usos. There's many matches they've had before, but they put on a clinic <clears throat> Friday night. This and 24 minute match overall, three segments on TV with two commercial breaks, and they put you on the edge of your seat. There were times when they literally had me. Be- they had me. They had me bite on the on the false finishes. I thought legit. They were. That was it. That was. Those were the false finishes. Yeah, and it was not. And beautiful, beautiful. And I was actually looking at Ru- and Rudy Charles was. Dan Engler was amazing in the match as a referee. I look that's part two. He's one of the best, anyways. But man, he does such. A, and I was just chomping it. I'm like drooling, going, "Oh, I would love to. I wish I was. I wish I was refing this match." You know, like you just that's that's when you know that you're you're watching something special. It was amazing, amazing job by those guys. Yeah, it was absolutely to me one of the top five tag team matches of all time. I mean, you named some of the greats. That, that's one thing I will say. When, when I was growing up, Daniel, when you were growing up, tag team wrestling was focused on a whole lot more than uh, than, than it is has been in the WWE as of late. But, you know, you named all the people you named, but you didn't name the Islanders, the Killer Bees, the Rougeos, Strike Force. I mean, we we lived during a time of tag team wrestling that will never be duplicated. Also that didn't means, name, I also didn't name Nick Densmore and Rob Conway either. You know what I mean? So... Well, that that's British true. Bulldogs. The Bulldogs, yes. How did I forget that? Did I, I say the mission. Islanders? Did I say the Islanders? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the Samoan SWAT team, uh, often seek. I mean, w- we will never have a time like we had back then. But with that being said, either of these two teams could have competed back in the days with any of those teams w- uh, without a hitch. So uh, I also was on the edge of my seat. I also thought multiple times that the New Day. No, the Usos are my favorite team right now over the last couple of years. The New Day was my favorite tag team for a long time, and then they kind of pushed them off in the – well, either Woods was hurt or Kofi was hurt. You didn't really see them a whole lot over the last year. 
So there were times when I was cheering for the Usos, against the Usos, uh, hoping that they they got the, the, the longest title reign, hoping that the New Day's longest title reign was saved. It was just, it was a roller coaster of emotions, and I too fell for a couple of the false finishes. And I don't, I, I don't know. I think that may be the, other than the one in Hell in the Cell, that matches up with that one for their best, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, two on two. I don't know if it beat the overall, the, like for the, year. I feel like it did. I feel like it's really close. Like it's 99.001 and 99.002. It's, it's very, very close to me. I'll have uh, and to go I, back and watch the Hell in the Cell just to remember, just to see if I'm like, at, you know, on the edge of my seat and like antsy and like, you know, have those little, you know, where I'm like, you know, what we, we, we you call it? Um, uh, Goosebumps. Pat, pat, yeah, that, but patting your foot, like, you know, kind of like your, your toe tap. Like, so I, like, I had to know if I was doing because I was doing that on Friday and I had to know if I was, I, I had to see if I do that again. Cause, cause I mean, I could watch, and the reason why I know that is I can watch WrestleMania 25, you know, Sean and Sean and Taker, which is the, the, the best match, in my opinion, the best match of all time. I can watch that. And I'm still like, oh, like I'm still get those moments. So if I if they can still do that for me in those old matches, which I I know this, well I've watched it twice already the SmackDown match, and um and each time I was like, oh, I just um like yeah, it's it's so, such a great such a great just storytelling, great job they did. I really enjoyed it, and it led to what's going on with the with the Usos in it. And so, but, oh, I'm sorry with the blood on it too. But by the way, real quick, congratulations to the Usos for being the top. The the longest reigning WWE tag team champions of all time. They officially hold that title uh, now. Um, congratulations, um, and uh, they they deserve it. And uh, you know it's um, yeah it's it's uh, and I I don't know who's gonna t- who's gonna um, defeat them. And the, you know it's gonna be the Viking Raiders. They're gonna be the ones to take the titles off them. I truly believe that. Uh, what uh, the only thing that irked me about that night is for the, the entire rest of the show they referred to the Usos as the longest reigning champions, tag team champions of all time. Even though that actual title would not be true until Monday, and I don't know why. You know, I've attention to detail, little things like that irk me. Uh, I also though enjoyed the 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 apparent reveal of the men's Survivor Series. Uh, team, the bloodline versus it looks like it's uh, the brawling brutes and Drew with the mystery person, uh, which I'm pretty sure we all know or we all think we know, or maybe I just know, but I'm pretty sure we know who that fifth person is. Yeah. No. I, does it rhyme with the letters? Um, the end. Well, the second letter ends in O. Is that does that make sense? Is that who we're thinking? That's who I. Think. Two letters. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that definitely seems to be going that way. But um, just to add about New Day, so I mean, no matter how many programs they're put together for, I mean, they just deliver match after match after match. And this last one, uh, culminating to that longest ever World Tag Team Championship title reign, um, tremendous, absolutely. And I just feel like I need to watch that back again too, as 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 where we're living. That tremendous match. Yeah, 100%. And um, it's uh, the only thing that, uh, what did y'all, what was your take on the, um, on the women's scramble? What did, what did y'all think about that match? Because I thought SmackDown overall was, was top throughout the whole show. But what, what was your take on the women's scramble? And you got any opinions on that? Any thoughts of who they put yeah. over? Like, sh- you know, sh- Shotzi. Shotzi. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a unique way to, have the new number one contender um i guess there really has there's not as much time to really build something right now between um said person before the scramble like who it would be with ronda prior to uh, survivor series so i think this was the unique way it really highlighted you know the talents there at smackdown with the with the women's division and um there's been a, a push there for shotzi so uh she's got her tank back and she's got her her groove back if you will all right well I um yeah I mean it's uh it's great it's great to see what's going to happen this SmackDown this week and then see what's going on with goes on with Raw next week as we're getting closer to uh, War Games Survivor Series um real quick let's touch base as quick as possible before Pinzer comes on AEW I know we recorded last week we talked a little bit about it but we're leading into 
um, our show um, we're leading into um, uh, what is it called? Dynamite. No, Full Gear. We're gonna watch yeah, no. Dynamite air. Dynamite be air. as we're recording this. Dynamite's gonna be airing like we did last week. So we, we'll try to give you live. In it, but we'll be interviewing Pins, so we're not really focused on that. But leading into leading into Full Gear. You know, uh, interesting to see um, uh, Soraya and and Burt Breaker. I think that's going to be your match, and MJF and uh, and Moxley is going to be the two that are going to be the show stillers. Anything else, I, I I'd be impressed to see if they can outdo what they're going to pull off. But I think that's that's where your money's at in those two matches. But you never know. There's always could be another surprise. Could be some returns. You know, could be some returns that could happen. Some so, so, some very high level. Some would say maybe elite. Yeah, return. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll go with return. that. Maybe, maybe. I, I also think Jamie Hayter's walking out with that championship, and that's going to be great for the storyline between her now being the lead person in in that faction and Britt kind of like playing second mm-hmm. fiddle. So that interests me a whole lot. Yeah. And shout out, shout out. Last, I know you're talking about AEW. I didn't want NXT to get lost in the mix. They announced a new match, which to me it rem- reminded me a whole lot of the King of the Mountain match. What's well, a little? Uh, it's, the, yeah, it's it's. What is it called? What are the, they calling it? The Iron Survivor match. The Iron Survivor. So it's kind of like a deadline. It's, it's kind I of don't like, like a, the name of it, but it it, yeah, it, it, the, it looked like an interesting concept. Yeah, it, it, yeah. The name could be redone, but it's but it's a it's a cross between an Iron Man, um, the King of the Mountain. Uh, let, hey, let's King of the Mountain. Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, what is the other one? Uh, almost like a war games because it's per per like each person comes sure. out right, um, sure. and something else. But you know we'll get that. Why don't we go ahead and um, uh, let's we'll we'll talk more about that as we get coming in, in the next week or so. But let's get to our guest, uh, David Penzer. All right, we're back on the Ringside oh, Podcast with our guest here, the legendary uh, ring announcer, David. Penzer, and a good friend of mine, too. I should have threw that in there because we've become great friends over the last couple of years. Uh, Penzer, how the hell are you? I'm doing okay. Thank you for the intro. We are friends, and uh, you're a good guy. You're a little bit of a heat uh, getter every once in a while, but, uh, oh, but hey, you oh. know, you're, 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 still, you're still young. But my only thing is I'm curious. I know you were taking questions. I'm curious if uh, Brian Hebner wrote in and said, who's your favorite referee and why is it Brian Hebner? We'll get to that. We'll see if that was the question or, or, or not. Uh, you know, if that happened. But uh, but no. I'm just no. completely shocked, Daniel. Somebody admitted that they were your friend. I didn't know that you had any of those. Um, but could I? Could you edit that out? <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm we'll, we'll get it in post. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, edit it post. Cut it on post. Um, no, we right before you came on, we were talking a little bit about um, you know just what's going on in the current product. But then we also kind of kind of talked a little bit about your career as far as you know you started. Uh, and uh, the Global Wrestling Alliance, is that where you got your... Um... The Global Wrestling Alliance, yes. It was, uh, it was right at the height of Hulkamania. Everybody's talking about wrestling. It's all over the place. And, like, you know, WrestleMania took off. And somebody decided to uh, put a, uh, start a wrestling company and put, uh, put it on the penny stock market, which I don't even know if there's such thing as a penny stock market anymore. But anyway, there was back then. So basically for, like, you know, $1,000, $500, you know, you could own, like, you know, 5% of a wrestling company. I, I don't know the math, but and it, there was money and they had an office in a school and I was a big wrestling fan. And the connection was um, my dad was a um, psychologist, longtime psychologist in the area. And the guy who was in charge of the Global Wrestling Alliance, his name is uh, Mike Brandon. He wrestled as Dr. Red Roberts and his gimmick was that he was a psychologist. So he used mind games as a heel. Well, he was a shoot psychologist too. So my, my dad had a, a very close friend who was also a psychologist who knew him very well and said, hey, could this guy come down and kind of hang out? Maybe, you know, maybe he'll help you. And so I stooged around and talked to, uh, you know, I was a mobile DJ. I was doing weddings and, and sweet 16s and bar mitzvahs and stuff, you know, so I could talk on a mic. So I uh, just stooge around and uh, the great Malenko would give me uh, ring announcing advice. And I met Norman Smiley there, Dave Heath. They were all both breaking in at the time. Uh, and um, then I met this guy, Bob Roop, who was the booker, who, uh, who was a, a shoot Olympic wrestler. And um, we became friends. And after the company closed, we bought the ring and did indie shows. And I'm telling the whole story. But anyway, he got to, he's, he was friends with Ole Anderson. Ole got the book in WCW. Ole called him up, said, you want to be an agent? He said, yeah. I said, Bob, don't forget me. 
He said, I won't, thinking I'll never hear from him again. And he, he hooked me up with Jody Hamilton and 30, 32 years later, 30 years later, uh, still hanging around. Yeah, I mean, what a story. Uh, so so then, of course, you go on WCW um, in that uh, time frame. Um, what was it, 92, 93? I started bringing in I started bringing in what they called jobbers at the time, but we live in a different world, enhancement talent. And the jobbers didn't care they were being called jobbers because back in those days, if they were wrestling like Ric Flair on TV, then they could main event in their like local town. You know what I mean? Even though they were losing, they were having competitive matches most of the time. So a guy like Bob Cook, I don't know if you ever heard of him. You know, Bob Cook would you know the guys respected him. He had a great punch. Uh, you know, so he, uh, he put over Arn, but they'd have a competitive match. And the next week he put over uh, Terry Taylor, but they'd have a competitive match and, and et cetera, et cetera. And he became a star in, in the Tampa, you know, uh, Sarasota area where he lived. So when I say star, I mean, he was main eventing indie shows. So, right. you know, be- better than opening up indie shows. And, uh, you know, instead of getting, you know, 20 bucks and a hot dog, he maybe got 150 and, you know, got to sell his merch. So. Um, so it was a different world, but, uh, yeah, I started doing that around 90. Okay. Okay. What, um, did you ever, um, I guess, cause I, I'm jumping ahead here, but I know that we've personally talked and, and you've always said, I think you've, and I put this, I've heard you say this on other podcasts too, as well, that you've never officially had a contract. So I guess you never had a contract for WCW, right? They just brought you in. Okay. They brought me in to, well, I, I didn't even get paid from WCW when I first started. What the deal was, and this was a common deal uh, all of, from all over the, the, the there was uh, Rip Rogers out of Louisville, who I'm sure you know, yeah. interesting guy. There was um, uh, Mike uh, Jackson, who still wrestles out of um, Tennessee and Alabama. There was me out of Florida at, at that point. And then there was the Italian Stallion and George South out of the Carolinas. Mm-hmm. And everybody would bring a... Uh, um, a uh, van load of wrestlers and the wrestlers in kind would, they made $150 to do the job. They give the, re- the people a $25 booking fee. The only difference is like when Mike Jackson did it, he also wrestled. So he got his pay and all those booking fees. I didn't wrestle. So I was just getting booking fees. So about a hundred, $125 when we were just doing a single shot, the uh, WCW paid for the rental of my van and my gas. And, um, yeah, but then when I got the job in WCW, yeah, I became an employee. They were like, you don't want to be under contract. You want to be an employee. You have kids. You have a young family. You'll have great insurance and benefits. And I did, but uh, never never, never saw the big money. I mean, I, I, I didn't make bad money at the end, but I wasn't seeing, you know, 300, 250 grand like some of the guys that weren't even used. So, yeah, so I guess... Uh... I mean, but I mean, they're giving you benefits and whatnot. So yeah, you, you're. And actually, uh, actually, it saved my ass because when the company was sold to WWF, um, they gave all employees uh, for every month that you had as an employee, you got severance pay, full severance, full pay, oh, wow, full, full benefits, everything. So I probably would have had to got kicked out of my house by the by the bank or something. But this gave me seven months. Seven months of full pay to figure out what I was going to do. At the same time, I did some indie stuff and all that and pocketed that money. And then the second to last week before Severance ran out, I got um, hired by the XWF, Jimmy Hart and Brian Nobbs. And that's how I ended up here in Tampa. All right. And then now when did you, um, after WCW and, and, you know, like I said, so WBF and everything, when did you um, get the call for TNA? I got a call from Jeff Jarrett. I'll never forget it. I was driving my kid, my dumb kid at the time, my son, to a bowling alley for a birthday party. And he called. Oh, so you bring the jug everywhere, Walt. Yeah, absolutely. I'm drinking water. Yeah, I bring my, my gallon jug everywhere. Yeah. Do they charge you to like uh, to put the, to uh, check that on a plane? Well, actually, so what I do is I'm on a plane. I don't – if I had it empty, apparently I found this out like just recently. If it's empty, I could take it on a plane. Um, yeah, but I never, I never uh, travel with it because I'm like, well, it's, I'll just buy one. So what I do is I go to a gas station and buy a gallon one, and then we get uh, water free at the uh, venue, so I just fill it up. So. Yeah, I, well, I, remind me to tell you a funny story. Um, well, I will do that. It, 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 it'll go over the uh, people's heads, and 
So, but um, it has to do with water and impact wrestling. But yeah, they do. They they supply us with a ton of water. Um, anyway, um, and coffee. They're like all in love with coffee. Oh, I know. I'm I'm in. You, you know, I do that. You know, I'm in charge of like me and. Yeah, Ross. You're in charge of the coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah I do that. Yeah, I, I I don't think I've ever seen in my life Scott Tim Moore without a cup of coffee in his hand. I'm, Even yeah. like after the show, if he's having a cocktail, he has a cup of coffee next to him just to so, make him. Feel- so I, so I always get it in the morning, then I always I always uh, find a runner to get it throughout the day. Yeah. So yep. Yeah, so um, lots of coffee, lots of water, a little Gatorade here and there, a little box of uh, lunches, sandwiches and stuff. Not bad. I enjoy it. Yeah. Um, what was really good was when we were in Nashville, that gyro place, and they had that prime rib. We're yes. talking all over the place. Yeah, we are. We are. We are. The I'm prime rib. Yeah. And, I, and I'm drinking I'm, I'm drinking Coke Zero, so I'm not even drinking. Anyway, so I was driving my son to a uh, bowling alley for a – birthday party he was probably eight ten and um jeff jarrett called me and said what are you doing next week and i said because i because i was a vice president and co-owner of a very successful airbrush tattoo company we had over 200 zoos uh aquariums and uh theme parks in north america and uh almost 30 cruise ships so uh I was, you know, I had a, I had recreated myself. And so he said, Hey, you got any time to come and do, do bring it out. And I said, sure. I said, what's the deal? He goes, well, um, Shane Douglas, uh, checked himself into rehab. He's been doing our uh, backstage guy, mean gene role. And JB has been our ring announcer, but he's going to move to the backstage role until Shane is ready to come back. So it, he said, it might be a week. It might be three weeks. He said, but uh, please understand something. As soon as Shane comes back, JB's going back to ring announcer and, and you're out of there. And I said, all right, well, let's see what happens. I lasted six years on that run, thankfully, because JB was such a good backstage interview. Yeah. Wow. So that's how that happened. And um, I lasted six years on that run. And then uh, Bischoff and Herbie came in to do production and they hated uh, Jeremy Borash doing backstage. At the time, I don't know if you remember this, but at the time they had like Hervey behind the cameras asking the guys questions, like off camera. Oh, off camera. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I got a call one day, you know, Terry Taylor was in charge of talent relations and Terry would, whenever he would call you, he would say anybody, whenever he'd call anybody, he would say like, you know, any of the talent, he would say, hey, this is Terry Taylor. I'm not calling to fire you because obviously when the talent relation guys called, you think you're getting fired. So he would just cut that off right at the top. So I got a call. And the funny thing is, it's like a week, two weeks before he called me in his office at the tapings and he goes, are you leaving? And I said, why would you think I'm going anywhere? He said, I mean, they were paying me really good money. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was a blast to go down there. You know, I could do my day job from Universal on a a laptop and a cell phone. Um, And, you know, I I sat around and and after the show and drank with Mike Tanay and Don West and Jeff and Ric Flair. And I mean, it was a, a, a... Potpourri of guys. It was a blast. So I was like, why would I leave? Because I don't know. Somebody on the internet said you were leaving. I said, I'm here for as long as you guys want me. He goes, good, because we're very happy with your work and we don't want you to leave. So I went home and I told my wife to buy a new car. Two weeks, two weeks later, the phone rings. Hi, this is Terry Taylor. I said, what happened to you? You're not calling to fire me. Well, I'm not firing you, but I'm letting you go. You didn't do anything wrong, but JB is moving back to ring announcer. I said, well, that's always been the deal. I said, I got six years out of, out of two weeks. So I appreciate the, the phone call. Now I just got to figure out a way to pay for my wife's new car that I bought after you told me that you valued me and didn't want me to go anywhere. Wow. And, that was, so there, and there, was a, there was a fun six years in the middle of that where I had the time of my life. It was not the stress of WCW. WCW I was personally invested in. I um, was on the – at the end, I was on the booking team. At one point, me and Jimmy Hart and Arn Anderson – and Tony Schiavone took over the Saturday night show from a creative standpoint and production standpoint um, until that show started getting b- uh, better ratings than Thunder. And as Jimmy Hart suggested, then we were canceled because um, you couldn't get better sh- uh, ratings than the show that the main bookers were doing and with the with the main stars. And um, and then um, I was in talent relations there and did production and uh, I was personally invested there. In Impact, in, in TNA, I wasn't personally invested. I just went there. I, 
I had a great time talking to people and telling stories and hearing stories. And um, I mean, if you've ever been around Mike and Don, two of the most incredible people just to sit and shoot the shit with. Um, and uh, we would have different people come in during the day in our little room. Jim Cornette would come in when he was there, sit for about a half hour, tell stories. Kevin Nash would come in for about an hour, tell stories. Uh, even Bully Ray would come in. I reminded Bully Ray when he came back to Impact. I remember, I said, do you remember Bully Ray time? And it was so funny because he would always come in and every taping and we'd sit there for about a half hour, 45 minutes, he'd tell stories. And one time uh, Devon came in and goes, why is he in this room with you guys every freaking week? He said, everybody, nobody likes him. I'm the one everybody likes. They think he's an asshole. Which, which was actually, as you know, at, at the time, you know, Devon was the one that was friendly and Bully was dependent on his mood. Right. Although he's, he's much more laid back this, this run, I got to say. He is. I think that, that what is that, uh, the older you get, the more calmer, relaxed, or wiser. Although he may be working us, you know, because everybody's telling Josh, you know, uh, Alexander not to trust him. So he may be working us and he's going to turn heel on all of us. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. He has to deal with uh, Dave LaGreca all the time on Busted Open. So maybe uh, maybe he's. Um, maybe I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I enjoy um, Busted Open too. I that, it. No, I enjoyed hanging out with Bully, but, you know. He could be a little prickly sometimes back in the day. I've heard the stories. Um, a little, little moody. Yeah. Well, you know, that, all of us can get that way, though. Um, one of the questions, and, and this, I, I'll add to this name, and I was, I don't know if this is a, from Jimmy Timmy. No, I'm sorry. Timmy Jimmy. I said it backwards. Like it really matters. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll go give him a shout out. And I looked this up. So they said that on. Um, this happened in, I guess, in 2008. Uh, I don't know if it was a, it was an episode of the show or if it was a pay per view, but apparently, so Kurt Angle like kind of beat you up and and did an ankle lock, but then like you legitimately got injured and your face was. You never all... saw that picture? No. Remind I... me to show you the picture. I'll even try to send it to you so you can put it up on another podcast. But uh, oh, you don't you don't have video. You could you could tweet well, it we out. Put it, we put it on our Instagram, yeah. But um, but uh, yeah, so. He was supposed to do four things. Well, he said if he was feuding with Jeff Jarrett, he said if Jeff Jarrett doesn't come out, somebody, one of the announcers is getting their ass kicked. So Jeff didn't come out. So he came back and he came out. He goes, pointed at Tanae, Eeny, Meeny, Miney, and they pointed at me. I was Mo. I, 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 and this was obviously, you know, we're not the k this, But um, the, the key is, the thing is, I had a, a trade show for my other business that we in Orlando at the Orlando Convention Center. So Jeff allowed me to do the trade show and come in at like 5.30. So I wasn't in the production meetings. I didn't really get a chance to go over anything with the guys. I really didn't need to. I was just the ring announcer. But um, but this particular day, there was something I could have gone over. And I guess in hindsight, Kurt was afraid that since we didn't get to go over it, that I wouldn't sell it. So he laid it in a little bit more than he normally would. And he normally lays it in. So... Uh, yeah, my face looked like the elephant, man. I'll show you the picture, and, and you can put it on uh, Instagram. But um, yeah, uh, he's, he every time I see him, he apologizes. And um, I got a $500 bonus from from TNA, so that was cool. Went home, put ice on my face, and uh, it went, you know, swelling went down a little while. But, yeah. Wow. It was uh, the, the ankle lock and the, 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 the clothesline was brutal. No, it was an elbow to the face, and then he uh, then he uh, closed behind me. That I didn't even feel, and then not because I was knocked out from the thing. I, it was just really light. Like, I think he knew he like that. He he almost knocked me out, and then um, he did this thing where he was taking off my shoe and he was hitting me in the back of the head. So he said, "Put your hands behind your head, like you're you know if, like the police were arresting you behind your head, and then put your arms over your ears." Well, I did that, but he overshot one of them. And the heel of my shoe hit me in the top of my um, uh, cheek. Wow. And uh, so I had one one side of my face that was exploded from the elbow. And then he put me in the ankle lock, and you can't even feel that. Uh, not even with Kurt. And Kurt's, you know, more stiff. But, um, but yeah, I had my both sides of my face were blown up. So, uh, yeah, that was always – that was a fun thing. And uh, thank you, Jimmy, Timmy, Kimmy. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, whatever. No disrespect. <laughs> Jeremy, do you have a question? Oh no, I mean I don't really have a question. Uh more the, more so than a comment. I uh I 
I've always appreciated what, what you, your con- contributions to the business. Um, there's a lot of things in WCW and TNA and impact that weren't always at times weren't always at, at the very, you know, the best they could be. But the one thing we could always count on w- was you and, uh, you, 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 ref- you referenced them earlier, not necessarily to you, but you, you were the mean Gene Okerlund of impact in TNA. And, uh, just to share, share a short little story. And then I, Daniel's our quarterback here. So I'll let him throw the ball. Um, me and my brother came down about, I think it was about nine months ago to an impact taping. And it was d- during a very difficult time for me. Uh, my dad was sick. They told us he was terminally ill. They I'm weren't sure how much I appreciate that. I just had well, issues with, with my father the last six months. He finally got home from, uh, uh, after six months this past week. So I understand that it's, uh, it's tough. Yeah. And he was in and out of the hospital for what Daniel about five years. This yeah. was, this was, this was a very, very long and drawn out, uh, battle cancer overcame it yeah. three times and still That's ended that. up ultimately passing from it, uh, so a few, a few months after that, but we got there, we, me and my brother had been taking care of both my mom. She was sick, not as sick as dad, but she was sick too. And we had just had no time for ourselves. So Daniel hit us up and was like, hey, y'all want to come down to Impact? So we were like, you know what? They were both in the hospital. We At this point, uh, mom had fallen, so she was in the hospital. So it wasn't like a situation where only dad was sick and we had to be there with mom. They were both being taken care of. So we're like, all right, we'll go down. We'll watch. Sat there uh, both days, had a phenomenal time. And as we were walking out, you you – you shouted out to me. You're like, Hey there. And me and my brother turned around and you're like, did you enjoy yourself tonight? I said, you don't know how much I enjoyed myself tonight. This took, this took a lot. I was able to just escape everything crappy that was going on. And that meant a lot to me, man. And I can just tell just, just by our conversation tonight, everything I thought about you, your genuineness, uh, your kindness, like that's all 100% real. And I appreciate you, man. Well, I appreciate the, the kind words, and I'm sorry that you went through a rough five years. Uh, yeah, but um, there's three people that can never be compared. Nobody could ever be compared to uh, um, uh, Howard Finkel, Bobby Heenan, and uh, Mean Gene Okerlund. So I appreciate the sentiments, but uh, I, w- I can never be compared to Mean Gene Okerlund. There's those are three people that st- they always talk about uh, Mount uh, Rushmore's of everything. They have their own Mount Rushmore's, all three of those guys. Well, you were you were my mean gene. How about that? Thank you. I appreciate that. But uh, I actually got the I actually got I met Howard a couple of times, but I got the privilege in WCW of becoming friends and hanging out with Mean Gene Okerlund and Bobby Heenan, and um, uh, it was just like it was it was what an honor and and privilege and the stories they would tell and their shtick was real. They didn't discuss it ahead of time, and they did it. 24 seven, whether there was a camera on or not. And, uh, um, I remember when I was in college and, uh, me and my friend would watch, um, remember Tuesday night, t- uh, it was, maybe it was Friday night. They did a, back in the day, they did a wrestling talk show. Yeah. Yeah. It was Tuesday night Titans. Tuesday night. They did a wrestling talk show. And, um, I, sh- I, I, I shouldn't say this, although it doesn't really matter anymore. And I haven't done it in 50 years, but, uh, well, I'm 56. So I guess 40 years. But so me and my um, my my friend who liked wrestling would get stoned and uh, watch Tuesday Night Titans, and I'll never forget. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, you're allowed. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I, I haven't smoked in forty years. Um, I think I'm the only one who hasn't. <laughs> um, that's another. That's a whole. That's a whole different story. Uh, <laughs> and that was a joke, by the way. That was a joke. Wait. Um, so we were sitting there, and I said to my friend, I said, "Man." If I could have a cocktail with anybody in the world, living or dead, I think it would be Bobby the Brain Heenan. Never in my wildest dreams thinking I'd ever get to meet Bobby or, or and let alone become friends with Bobby and, and ride with Bobby and, and have Bobby over to my house when I moved, came to Tampa and his lovely wife, Cindy, who just passed. Uh, it's just amazing, uh, you know, the, the, the things that I've gotten to, to, uh, to do. Uh, I'm a very blessed man. Yeah. yeah, Bobby was one of the all-time top three. And, you know, you can you can lump them, put everybody in there together. He was definitely top three as far as entertaining 
and uh, I'm pretty sure Bobby's the one that that started getting me to to back talk my parents a little bit too. You know, it gave me a little bit of confidence <laughs> and a little bit of a slick mouth, and you know, you, you could learn all that kind of stuff from Bobby the Brain Heenan. But yeah, so yeah, much was, appreciation. He, he's, he's a super. He was a super guy, and, and yes, sir. Be able to meet him, let alone become his friend, was. Uh, one of the honors of my lifetime. Linda, you have a question? Yeah, I mean, first off, David, it, it's just a privilege speaking with you. Really enjoy hearing these stories. And also, just in front of my eyes here, just seeing that friendship that has blossomed, bloomed between you and Daniel. Now, I know there is the importance of ring announcer and referee. So, uh, Daniel, I've known you for a while, maybe almost two years now. And, uh, you know, we have to build our own type of chemistry when I'm down there in Louisville as well, when we're, we're performing. So David, I want to ask you just that importance between ring announcer and official to you. Yeah. I mean, it's important to have chemistry in, in life, you know, um, mm-hmm. it's important to have chemistry in your, in your, you know, uh, relationship romantically. It's important to have chemistry, uh, with people that you work with, but yeah. Um, you know, I, I always, I always sort of gravitate towards the referees and the announcers. Um, just cause that's who I always hung out with. And, uh, you know, at the shows we had, a at the, at the, uh, WCW shows, we had, um, announcers room and the referees would dress in there too. So a, a dress dressing room. And then in, um, uh, in TNA, we all, the announcers dressed in a, um, in a little closet that also had a washer and dryer where people would come in and like wash their clothes and dry them. So, uh, but it had a little rack where you could hang all the suits and all that. So it was convenient, but, um, but yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of it is after the show, you know, me and Daniel like to grab a cocktail or two and, and tell stories. And, uh, you know, I always, always like to grab a cocktail or two before I go to bed after the show. So, uh, so yeah, we kind of had fun that way. Although I could drink him under the table. <laughs> I, probably I believe that. I believe that. No, probably I really can. can't. No, I, I really can't actually. But uh, well, believe it or not, he uh, Pinzer will go to bed before. Well, that's back when the Brian Hebner days, uh, which was just was re- just recently. It ain't like it's been years ago, but uh, we'd be up late, late, and uh, Pinzer be like, "I'm, I'm out, I'm gone." And now I'm kind of, I'm kind of realizing Pinzer was a smart one now, so I'm, I'm able to go to sleep a lot earlier that Brian's not around, and uh, and uh, I'm like, man, what, why would not I, I miss this, this for a whole, you know, eighteen months? But uh, but I, I learned a lot under. Well, 30 days. years, 30 years on the road. I've learned a lot of things. And, uh, one thing is, uh, always remember that there's a that you have to be up the next morning and you have to be able to function unless you're making a plane or then you don't really have to be able to function. You just have to be able have to get on the plane right? exactly. get on the plane and fall back to sleep. So, uh, Speaking of so, uh, speaking of Brian, let's, he did he did send in two questions. Okay, <laughs> so uh, one of them is uh, well, I mean you kind of guessed it. He said I uh, want to know who your favorite referee is and uh, why is it Brian Hebner? And uh, he's more he's a shit disturber too. <laughs> but the uh, what you referees being shit disturbers. <laughs> That's uh, th- those of you that go back and listen to reffing uh, reffing it up with uh, Brian Hebner when Pinzer was on. I actually as a joke was asking that question. The his co-host was supposed to read it and said no, just kidding. But he read it as a shoot, and then it turned into this whole thing that. Um, uh, but it was pretty funny. But anyways, his other question is: this might be another um, thing to get you going. He wants to know why are you so cheap? Why and why are you always looking for a free drink? And how fast you were to snatch up those free tickets that Impact hands out at parties. <laughs> Hey man, thirty years of the business—you got to learn your way around the 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 the, the atmosphere. Um, I'm really not that cheap. Although I said somebody said I was cheap, and I told my wife, I said I'm really not that cheap. She's like, you kind of are. Um, <laughs> so I guess I am. I don't think of myself. I I will spend money on things that I enjoy. If I want to, if there's a good concert coming, you know, I'll, I'll get a, a you know spend some money on concert tickets. I really enjoy going to live music. Um, but, you know, on, 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 you know, like clothes and stuff like that, you know, it's like I remember I came off a plane one time and Josh Matthews was like, you go on planes like that. I was like in shorts and a sweatshirt and flip flops. And I'm like, Josh, I'm 56 years old and I've long discovered that it's much better. It's much better to be comfortable than give a shit what anybody thinks about what you're wearing. He said, I'll never be like that. And I said, I know you won't. <laughs> and he won't. <laughs> no, he's, he's in very. In, 
shout out to Josh. He's he's actually very uh, uh, very fashionable. Like he he dresses, yeah 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 he he, he oh uh, he and he's right. He'll never he could never walk off a plane looking like that because he has pride in his uh, his appearance and his uh, his um, his dressing. You know, he's a sharp dresser and yeah, you know that's cool. I'm not. <laughs> So, but I like, I, I like Josh and uh, me and Josh had some fun and um, uh, I guess I'll be seeing him in a little bit here. Yeah, we'll be seeing, yeah, we'll all be seeing, I'll, we'll all be seeing, but speaking of, you know, with the, we got um, Impact uh, Overdrive coming up uh, here in, here in Louisville where I, or where, where I, this, me and Jeremy are based out of, of course, but uh, uh, here in Louisville, Kentucky, and it's going to be a pretty, pretty solid show. What, what do you, um, you know, I know that you see you know go to the production meetings like i do and you see a lot of the formats and stuff what what is your take since this new regime i guess we call it since um scott demore at the time anthem scott demore don Callis took over now now it's just scott don at aw what's your take on this new uh new regime and what they're doing with impact wrestling i love it i absolutely love it um i'm not just saying that because i work there or because i have to i could i i could say i love it because i have to but I, I, I don't have to. I, I think the, the locker room is incredible. Um, the talent is unbelievable. Uh, the storytelling is logical. You got a little bit of comedy in there that makes sense and makes you chuckle like a Johnny Swinger, Ziggy Dice type of thing. Uh, but it doesn't challenge your, you know, it doesn't make you go, this doesn't make any sense. Where a lot of the stuff um, other companies do and, and TNA formerly under different regimes used to, you know, maybe under Vince Russo used to be a little bit too insulting haha but and the you know the matches are great the storylines are great you never know who's going to show up uh they're always bringing in new talent um and uh i I just can't say enough about it i um i'm I'm proud to be there i've known scott for 30 years scott was i used to bring scott in to do uh enhancement matches in wcw when he was 18 years old um and uh he's always uh uh smart guy confident guy um takes a side and will stick by it. No, even if, you know, other people, uh, you know, challenge it. So, uh, you know, the writers are great. The production people, Gail and Tommy. And I, I, I just, I, I got nothing bad to say and everything great to say. It's a, uh, it's a wonderful place. I look forward, even though at, at my age, I don't really like to travel and stuff. It kind of wears me down a little bit. I'm looking forward to getting, especially being off the three and a half weeks. I'm looking forward to getting on that plane, coming to see everybody and, being a part of Overdrive and Kentucky Chaos, I think that's called the yeah, next night, yeah. and um, and uh, see where things go, man. But I can tell you one thing: Josh Alexander versus Frankie Kazarian. I could bet you it's going to be incredible. Uh, Black Tarus versus Trey Miguel for the X Division title. I could guarantee you it's going to be incredible. Um, uh, Jordan Grace versus Masha Slamovich, last woman standing. I could guarantee you it's going to be in- incredible. And every match down the line will be incredible. It's just, it's unbelievable. I almost sometimes wonder how they're going to, I almost sometimes feel bad for Josh since he's been in the main event, since he's been world champion, because, you know, he has to top all these matches for, you know, in three, in a two and a half hour show. And uh, he he always finds a way to do it. He does. He does that uh, for sure. Now, one of the things that um, I shared uh, before, and I think we kind of have a cool story is that, uh, Pinzer, is that you and I both uh, did, were just, booked for this one event didn't know what the future held uh right before the pandemic and and um uh march of 2020 at the coca-cola roxy center in atlanta georgia we were at that tv taping that also did a tna special uh episode which is why you were brought in uh for that and i was brought in because they forgot to book a referee and they just happened to use me on a on a recent local ovw run and um and then come to find out, we, we were at that show. I mean, there's a lot. We could talk about a lot of things that happened with Steiner and whatnot. But, um, but yeah, we were at the show, and we were we – were, um, Brandon told the other referee he was helping us. He, he was driving us around, or we were – I forget. I just remember us being together, uh, going to the hotel and to the car and talking. You um, brought up the Al Snow story that you told me to ask him about when I see him, which I we did I did years uh, – months later. But um, – but but the cool thing about it, well the cool and bad thing about it the bad thing about it, the pandemic happened right after that and it shut everything down, but the good thing about with that is that it still allowed us to 
uh, be on the list of opportunities when it opened up for you know them to tape in inside the um, studio uh, close set, and uh, we got the opportunity to go and do it, and still we're still here to this day. So, tell me a little bit about the experience of what you went through on that um, that whole being being asked to be in that show, and what that what your future held there. And then next thing you know, you're you're you know you're still there to this day. Before I answer that question, I want to say to um, to Brian Hebner. I love Brian Hebner, but I was just recently on his podcast. Yeah. He didn't have the balls to ask me those questions on his podcast. <laughs> he had to send them to you to ask me on your on your podcast. So very disappointed, Mr. Hebner, but I still love him. Um, and you're right. I would. There's never been a uh, drink coupon that I haven't uh, that I haven't grabbed. Um, as far as the, hey, his uh, dad, his dad's the same way. Earl, did you see Earl have them all? Like, the, the, yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah, he knows. Hey. <laughs> it, it, I'm, I'm happy to pay, but if somebody else is willing, God bless them. Go ahead. 100%. Um, so regarding the, the, the thing, a couple of fun stories. So um, I used to watch me and my wife, uh, well, my wife was just used to sit here on the couch. I would watch AEW Live when it first started just because um, I'm really good friends with Jericho. He's always entertaining and it was a new product. And I, you know, I didn't even realize that, you know, uh, you know, I knew Impact was still around, but I didn't know what they were doing. I didn't really pay attention to them. I didn't like WWE, so I started watching AEW just because it was live and it was different. And um, so there was this episode where uh, they brought uh, Gary Capetta on to do a uh, weight, uh, like a, a like to get your like a weight, not like weight lifting, but like they had a scale in the ring oh, and yeah, he okay. sort of hosted it. So my wife said to me. Are you disappointed that they didn't call you? And I said, no. I said, when Gary did ring announcing WCW, he did a lot of that kind of in-ring interview stuff. I said, I never did that. But once Mean Gene was there, that was always, everything went to Mean Gene. God bless him for a reason. Um, I said, so I'm not mad at all. And uh, I'm I'm glad for Gary. And uh, so um, she's walking up the stairs to go to bed because I go to bed late most of the time. And um, she looked at me and she said, are you sure you're not upset? And I go, huh, I swear I'm not upset. I'm, I have my podcast. That's nice to keep way to keep me around the business. But I'm, I understand I'm 55 years old, 54 years old. It's a young man's sport and probably seen my last uh, run. And I am very cool with it. And she goes, okay. Two hours later, I get a text from Scott Demore. How'd you like, what are you doing next weekend? No, nothing. How'd you like to come to Atlanta to do commentary for the uh, for the throwback show? And then we could we'll have you in Tampa when we do the show, do the commentary as well. I said, great. So I went there. So then the pan- so pandemic was like, I mean, like three days after we got back yeah. from Atlanta. Literally, I mean, literally, I've told the story before the day, the, the, the Friday night tapings. I th- we started late. We were because traffic was so. We had to start an hour and a half late because Donald Trump was the president at the time. He was in town visiting the CDC, and they shut everything down. So like we had no fans. We had to wait till they opened up the traffic to get there. So we started later because of that. Do you remember that, Pinzer? Yeah, a little bit. Now that yeah. you mentioned it, I wasn't really because I wasn't ring announcing, so I wasn't really as focused on that. I was petrified doing play by play for the first time since. Uh, 1997, mm. and back then I did it with Larry Zabisco, who carried me. So, um, but uh, so I, I was I, I was having a little panic attack uh, in, in the dressing room, going over uh, my my notes. So I, I, I but I recall later was that probably now. starting later was probably a good thing for you then. Yeah, <laughs> I recall that now that you mentioned it. Yeah. Um, so that was that was fun, and you know then COVID happened. So we're watching AEW now. This is when they're in an empty. I think they were in um, Glacier's gym mm-hmm. uh, uh, or wrestling school. Anyway, it doesn't really matter where they were, but they they had the um, the wrestlers that weren't wrestling at, on in the match. They were out like copying and booing and all that. Do you remember mm-hmm. that? Yeah, remember that. Yeah. Which was, I mean, I'll give them credit. That was smart. Um, so my wife looks at me and said, "I don't think." I would want you in this pan. Now, I remember at this point, we didn't know if everybody was dying or not. We didn't right. know what. So she was like, I don't think I'd want you to, to go do a wrestling show. I'm like, Lisa, who's calling me to do a wrestling show? I said, 
Nobody's calling me to do a wrestling show during a pandemic. She said, you sure? Two hours later, I get a text from Scott Demore. True story, I swear to God. What are you doing next week? Nothing, why? It's a freaking pandemic. Nobody's doing anything. How'd you like to come to Nashville? We're doing empty, uh, we're doing the empty arena studio wrestling for taping. So I said, well, I'd love to, but I just promised my wife I would never go do anything like that. She said, well, he said, well, talk to Lisa because he's known Lisa for almost as long as I have. And um, talk to Lisa and get back to me tomorrow. So first one, I, 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 she, um, I drove up and uh, they rented me a car and I drove up. And after that, I just got on the plane. I just said to her, I said, you know, the old saying from um, uh, Shawshank Redemption, you got to get ready. Uh, uh, what's this? You got to get uh, busy living and get or get busy dying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah. said, I'm not getting busy dying. I said, I'm going to do what I love. And whatever happens, happens. And, uh, you know, all these years later, we come to find out that, um, that uh, you know, it, 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 it did kill a lot of people horribly. And, and, and a lot of people still have issues from it. But it wasn't the, the plague like everybody thought it was going to be. But, um, but it's still a serious thing. And, you know, especially like my parents, I worry about them and, and um, people have pre-existing conditions. But you can't live your life in fear. And, and so I just decided to go do that. And it was really, I mean, it was real strange having no fans. Um, yes, it was. I remember the first time we did a pay-per-view. Now, usually, and now, like when I do Overdrive, I'll go at, out first. I'll welcome the fans. Good evening, Louisville. You know, a little bit more animated than that. And, uh, you know, uh, tell them, you know, you're going to be on TV, pay-per-view all over the world. Here are the uh, uh, play-by-play guy. Here's the, the this guy. Uh, and can count them down. You know, we're, we're two minutes away from going live all over the world. So that's what I always did. And that's what I do again. But it was the strangest thing when we did our first pay-per-view. I basically, five minutes before the show, just sat down at the little uh, ring announce table where the bell is. And didn't. And the, the show started. And I was like, this is bizarro world. Um. But it was interesting. I mean, there was it was the, I, I, I tell the story to some people. I didn't really get to know most of the talent for like six or eight months because um, usually if you went into a new locker room, you would go around and shake everybody's hand and introduce yourself. Well, during COVID, nobody's shaking hands and introducing uh-huh. themselves. Everybody yeah. has masks on. And you were at a different uh, hotel than, than the talent. Yeah, was, yeah right? and yeah. I was at a different hotel. There was an a, a office hotel and there was a, a talent hotel. And uh, I was at the office hotel. So, um, so yeah, and then at the, the tapings, I'd be like, you know, hey, David Penzer, nice to meet you. And, you know, hey, Rich Swan, you know, but from like 30 feet away. So, uh, but yeah, it was, it was definitely different. And, but you know what? We put out, we put out stuff that, you know, back then, when it first started, when, before Scott called me, I was like watching, like, I was so desperate for entertainment. I was watching like Japanese base, empty your arena baseball, empty stadium baseball with, um, uh, uh, English announcers doing the play-by-play from their uh, from their um, from their offices in their homes. I mean, guys, I didn't even I didn't know any of the players. And they and the the cool thing was that the uh, the um, the announcers would like give a little background on some of the guys, especially the Americans, because there's a lot of Americans who play in in Japan, and um, so they'd let them know, you know, oh, you know, it was uh, in the you know the Blue Jay system and blah 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 blah. And that it was that, and um, they were showing a uh, uh, what's the game where you throw a, a bean bag and try to get in the hole? Cornhole. 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 I mean, there was nothing. So you know, the fact that we were able to you know give some people something, even though it was a little awkward without fans, uh, was uh, was really cool. And um, then you know. Slowly but surely, we got back. Uh, not when I say we, I don't mean impact. I mean the world and the country. You know, got slowly but surely got back to normal, and uh, I guess we're as close to normal as we've been since then. Yeah, and one of the things uh, you know, I, I will say that, um, and I think you've said this before publicly, but you'll, you know, when you get um, book, when you get booked on the next trip, you uh, you send out a message or whatever to, to Gail him and say up oh, another one I made another one or whatever what's your line you say uh, uh yeah made another one made another yeah. one yeah or take anything for granted yeah like i said this is a young grad business and um 
And I appreciate the fact that they appreciate a singer, a, a, a senior presence as uh, the, the the host of the show for the live fans and the and announcing the matches for the fans of TV, for the fans watching the TV. And I appreciate that. But you never, you know, you never know. One week Terry Taylor said, "Please don't go anywhere. Don't ever leave." I bought a new car. Two weeks later, something changed. Right. So uh, every time I get a uh, a plane ticket, I've done this from the very beginning. No matter who was sending it to me, whether it was Bob Ryder or God bless him, I miss him a lot, or whoever was, you know, different people that have done it after Bob left. Um, after Bob left us, unfortunately. Um, you know, I always sent, you know, thank God I made another. Mm-hmm. Appreciate it. I just did that with uh, WrestleCade. And they're, they're bringing me to WrestleCade. Speaking of WrestleCade, you'll be there, and Impact is doing the IPWF. Um, uh, show which is the throwback show uh somebody uh sent a message here or, or a question in eric cornish he does the he's the ring announcement for o- ovw and yeah uh, uh what's his name uh what was the gimmick name well he says who is this cla- who is the classic announcer he most looks up to and why is it artichoke jenkins <laughs> <laughs> i'm sensing the theme i love artichoke jenkins Big fan. um the, the funny thing not to dodge that question but the funny thing is is that um I'm a huge fan, as you probably know. I think we've talked about it of these throwback shows. Yeah, yeah. I'm total Mark for it. I even I bought them when uh, uh, when uh, I bought the ones that I wasn't booked on uh, when Artichoke was there. And um, well, I didn't buy the pay per views. I actually bought the 4.99 YouTube Ultimate Insider. Yeah, yeah, thing. Ultimate Insider. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I would always beg Scott to let me do these shows, and I even came up with a character, uh, Josh Matthews. When he was the, the play-by-play, was uh, his was was Scott Demore's character, who was the promoter's son. Right, right. And I was, and I uh, uh, came up with the character that I would be Scott Demore had um, that. What, what, what's what's the name of the character? Oh, um, uh, Josh. Oh gosh. No, no, Scott's character, Giuseppe. Yeah, Giuseppe. Yeah, Giuseppe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Giuseppe, when he would, uh, you know, Giuseppe would do, you know, do the territories, go from town to town. Every weekend had a had a uh, illegitimate kid who turned out to be me. So I was going to be Giuseppe's illegitimate kid, and I was, the whole thing was going to be Josh basically insulting me, you know, as much as he could without getting overkill because he was, you know, he hated the fact that I had had laid like some kind of claim to. Which, which knowing Josh, that. he would have had fun with that. <laughs> oh, I'd have loved it. I'd have loved it. But um, oh, I'm sure he would have. Yeah. But uh. But Scott always said no, no, no. I, I said, can I, can I go to Wrestle WrestleCon to do the, the, the show? No, no, no. We we'll use somebody local. I think they used um, uh, Alicia. Yeah. And uh, so I didn't ask this time. I figured, um, fam, my father's finally back at home. We'll have a family Thanksgiving. No worries. So I get an email from Gail that says, if you're receiving this email, you are booked for WrestleCon. So I called Gail. I said, I think you sent me this email by mistake. And she said, she said, no, you're definitely booked, 100 percent booked. And I'm like, that is the strangest thing, because I've been begging Scott to, to do these, these shows and he always blo- he never lets me. And now I didn't even ask him. And he, I said, I think I figured out the deal with Scott. Just don't ask him. and You'd be booked every week. But um, <laughs> but so I'm curious what my character of anything is going to be. Maybe I'll be David Penzer because I'm so old that I was still that was the young David Penzer back in the day. I put on the. The colorful cummerbund and bow tie. I don't know. We'll see. Or maybe you'll be like uh, you know Joe Pinzer or something, and his son David. But the, the, a... the, 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 the thing is that the Giuseppe's illegitimate kid wouldn't really work because Josh, who does a fantastic job as executive producer of these shows, uh, in the truck is obviously not doing the play by play. He has a lot more important things and does a fantastic job. Um, I'm not he, just saying wait, he did yes, it. I he told. he did it in well. It never aired because uh, I, I'm still don't know why that happened. But I think I know. But in the Dallas, he still did play by play in Dallas. Oh, did he? He oh. he he produced the other show and then came up and did did play by play. Yeah. So maybe I'll be Scott's illegitimate kid. I don't, we'll see. Yeah. Um, but uh, <sighs> but, but yeah. Um, so I'm I'm curious to see. I'll ask him when I see him, and uh, I'm happy to be at WrestleCade. So. Uh, uh, I'm also doing the main event of the Super Show the next afternoon, so that's cool. Yeah, this is my oh, first WrestleCade as well, so I'm going to be there um, for the show, but then also helping with the booth and being part of the Impact booth and all that, all the signings. Of I did, I did so. WrestleCade a few about five years ago, 
uh, mm. first class event. The guy Tracy that does it, uh, he's a, owns several car dealerships, all very successful, and there's a reason why, because he runs a, top, a first class uh, fan fest. Um, it's uh, it, it runs seamlessly. Uh, the hotel's like right across the street from the fan fest, the Marriott. It's uh, I, I I was excited to you know when I got the word that I was coming because I hadn't been there in a bunch of years, but um. But yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be fun, and uh, and uh, appreciate Tracy uh, springing for another night and uh, letting me uh, bring announce his uh, main event. No, no, I don't know what the main event is yet. So no, no, I, I kind of asked this question, which was supposed to be the real question, on Brian's podcast. But what what would you say? In, and I'll rephrase it. Uh, what would you say are the moment, like some of your favorite moments you've had in your career, uh, from getting back all the way to WCW? Maybe you can. You know, do a WCW one and do a do a TNA one and do an Impact one, current Impact one. You know, one of each. Yeah, Scott Hall um, walking down the steps in Macon, Georgia, and grabbing my microphone, cutting an incredible promo to play off the WWE uh, scheme gene skits that they were doing, and mm-hmm. to make it out like uh, WWE was invading or WWF was invading WCW. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Greensville, South Carolina, the re, uh, re, reunification of the Four Horsemen. And Arn did a shtick about everybody and then acted like he forgot Ric Flair and Rick came out and the place blew the roof off. Um, TNA um, got anything with AJ Styles, Moa Joe, Kurt Angle. Uh, it was uh, a, lot of, a lot of fun moments. I would say probably the funnest moments were the ones where we went on the road to do pay-per-views. After what we used to do pay-per-views in the in um, the sound stage, and then at one point we went on the road to do them, and it was just really cool to have a, a, a different audience because you know the audience in, in at the sound stage was great, and they were dedicated and they worked hard to get uh, the, the the just the people that were just there uh, as as tourists involved. But uh, it was fun to, to to get back out on the road and uh, impact. I would probably say um, having the first time the fans came back was an incredible experience. Yeah, it, um, was. it was it was just electric uh other than that i would say the tjp josh alexander 60 minute iron man match was one of the greatest matches i've ever seen in my life and um and it was just uh it was honored to be to be there and announce it and then you just recently got to ring announce the main event for uh rick flair's last match um you know yeah that was super cool too i mean uh, the, um, i'm not you know that that was that was an incredible opportunity that kind of happened at the last minute, um, and uh, I think I wished myself on the show, but um, but yeah, I mean that was off. I, I that was like a because it was a combination of the old WCW crew, the old TNA crew, and the current Impact production crew. I'm yeah. talking production side. Yeah. So it was like almost like going to like like if you went to high school in one place and then you went to college in another place and then you went to uh you were working in a company it was like to have all three of those reunions in the same place at the same time so it was just incredible to see everybody and 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 see a lot of old friends that i hadn't seen in, in decades and and it was it was a special weekend for sure the um one of the things that i i enjoyed uh, that now the show's no longer around. Uh, if they finally canceled it, but it, it was uh, Impact Explosion epi- uh, shows. You actually had a had a little um, thing on there that you started. Did it for about a year, I guess, or half close to a year um, around the ring with 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 David Pinzer, and you would interview and do kind of a different kind of a concept. You would interview people, and one of the things I, I appreciated is you decided to do a referee episode where you interviewed all the refs and. No, we had referee month. Uh, referee month. That's right. It was a whole month. That's right. And you did you did a um, all the each ref. Uh, Brian just came back at that time, and you had a, us in there. I think you even put in Bravo in there, who was a ref for uh, yeah, Bravo, uh, Brandon, you, and uh, and Brian. Um, if Impact was to uh, bring, offer you something like that, you know, for the, the plus or the insiders, would you would you like just show that that's all it is, is something? Or you know, kind of like a BTI, but for fifteen, or maybe even give you a spot on BTI. Would you Would you be willing to do that? Would you be up to do that? I again? mean, that would be a lot of fun. I had a blast doing those interviews. I got to know things about these guys. That that's what, kind of when I started becoming friends with these guys. You know, mm-hmm. you start to to talk about the, you know, you hear their life story, and then you like have a connection with them, and you could have a conversation about something that 
you thought was really cool that they said in the interview and stuff like that. And then you start to get to know guys. Uh, and you could get a little closer than 30 feet and take a mask off uh, when you're in front of the camera. But, um, but yeah, I, I love to do that. Um, uh, you know, as you can see, it does, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, it, it's not a chore for me to talk and tell stories and, 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 and interview people. And, you know, I had my sitting ringside podcast for almost four years and, um, uh, which now lives on ad-free shows. Uh, so if you uh, were a fan of Sitting Ringside and you were like, oh, I'd love to re-listen to some of those shows, uh, you could join ad-free shows for, I think it's still as little as $9 a month and get access to our entire library of Sitting Ringside. Not to mention Arn Anderson, Eric Bischoff, uh, Bruce Pritchard, uh, Ric Flair, um, Jim Ross, and Kurt Angle. I hope I'm not leaving anybody You have Scott Stanner on there too, right? Who? Scott Stanner. Did you have Scott Center on on your show uh, as well? On Sitting Ringside? Yeah. Yeah, it was the only podcast he's ever done. And I remember you told me the story that you actually he was like, "Can you can you uh, share it or whatever on his Twitter?" And you showed him how to do it, right? You like tweeted it out for him or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, no, he he ran away from me for years, but I finally he was doing an appearance at a show that Dory Funk was promoting in Ocala, and I was booked to ring announce it. So I brought my producer with me. Uh, for that did the podcast. He was a wrestling fan too that produced the podcast and he brought equipment and I just kind of cornered him in the locker room and said, Scott, you're giving me five or 10 minutes. And he went on for 15 minutes and which was not as long as I would usually get, but for Scott, that was like an eternity. And he, he said to me afterwards, he goes, you know, I've been running from this for so long. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I said, you're going to do it. Any others? He goes, hell no. <laughs> He uh, he was just at uh, he was doing an appearance. I was at uh, Sammy's uh, uh, Callahan's promotion, Wrestling Revolver, uh, in Dayton, Ohio, and he was there. To, he just did the autograph signing, but it was it was cool. He was he was chatting with everybody. He said do, did it, he literally walked in um, fifteen minutes before he needed to be there. Did the signing, went around, said there about everybody, and when the show started, and left. So that sounds like Scott Steiner. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh... Yeah, I keep trying to get Sammy to do those shows, to, to, let, to bring me in to do those shows. But he, I mean, he's, he's straight up about it. He's like, I'm not paying, uh, because I got great ring announcers, uh, and I'm not paying airfare to bring in a ring announcer. I'm sorry. He's, I have mad respect for what you do, but I'm a businessman. And I well, said, well, I'm not. I only work the Dayton shows. He wants me in Iowa, but he's like, I can't, I can't, I'm not driving to Iowa. He knows, and we talked, and he goes, and they said, he goes, well, if I get to the point where I, can bring you in, I will, but because obviously the, it's more money to bring me in to go to that show. But but um, but I only do the Dayton ones myself. So maybe what what it needs to happen it needs to work out where he does one he, when he does those ones that are at the uh, the events we're already at. Like if he did one, at, he's not doing WrestleCade, but if he did one at WrestleCade, then that would work out. You were there, and then you yeah, could, you know, that, that, would, that would be that would be a blast, and um, uh, I'd love to do one. But uh, hey, he's a you know what. I've met a lot of people in this business and I'd rather have somebody look at me in the face and say, I'm not trying to, I'm not going to spend the money to buy a plane ticket for a ring announcer when I have perfectly good ring announcers, even though that you are well known and, and, and would it be in addition to my show, it's not worth a, a plane ticket to Iowa. And I, I have mad respect for someone who would say that as opposed to someone who would say, sure. And then every time I see him, when you go, yeah, let, let me, you know, I, you know, he was straight up about it and I respect that. No, absolutely. Um, and now here's the, here's something. I know Linda, you know, does rig announcing, and and of course, oh, I didn't um, know that. There's others that you know <laughs> listen to this podcast that do it as well. The guy that even does the intro to the show does it at time and time. If you it, you know if anybody inspiring rig announcer, someone just getting into the business like that, what do you have any advice? I mean, you could say advice for any young talent or wrestler, referee, whatever. But for a rig announcer itself, do you have any advice that you would give to these people to say, hey, you know, this is you know. How yeah, I would say focus on interaction with the fans. Um, there's a ton of people who could, I'm not saying anybody could, but there's a ton of people, a lot of people who could go out and read a card. Ladies and gentlemen, the following contest is set for one fall for the mid Hudson championship, indie, indie world championship, whatever, and, and read the card. Uh, I think that's one of the things that made me stand out, and I got it from Gary Capetta because it's very much the way the WCW tapings were is the ring announcer was very interactive with the audience when the cameras were paused. Um, and, uh, you know, so we, we, uh, we were Gary before me and I learned a lot so much from Gary and we were the glue that kind of held the audience interest because, you know, back then it was almost all enhancement matches. And, uh, 
You know, so I, I always say work on the interaction with the audience because that's what will set you apart when you can go out there and interact with the audience and ha- make them have a good time in addition to the wrestling, but just as part of the show um, that, 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 that separates you from, any, from anybody who could read off a card. Yes, that is very important. Really appreciate that insight and oh. in your numerous roles and just on your look on life as well. I, I love the positivity, the energy. Um, definitely resonates with um, all the things you do on um, TV as well. Thank you. You only you know what you only live once, and uh, you might as well make the most out of it. I got to live my dream for thirty years, and um, and it's still an honor to. It's still it's still it, it, it's still insane. I we, we had a not this last hurricane that came through, which was like a tropical storm, but we had a big hurricane that came in. Um, uh, it hit ended up hitting south by about a hundred miles, so we really didn't get much. But uh, Bill Eady, I get all these wrestlers texting me, all these legends texting me. Are you okay? Everything okay? Bill Eady, the mass superstar, who I I don't, you know, I booked him for one of my fan fests. We do a couple fan fests a year down here in uh, Tampa for uh, the focus on uh, the territory days. And, you know, I had booked him for a fan fest, but he didn't have to do that. And, you know, you have, you know, you think back to, you know, uh, driving loops with me and Gene and Bobby and Tony Schiavone. And it's just, you got to pinch yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you do. I mean, and I do that too. Like, there's times where I'll, um, I'll have moments where I'll, um, you know, say, "Okay, I've done this and that," but you know, um, there's certain things that I'll at the time I won't won't do anything, but then afterwards I'll, I'll reminisce, look back on the, what I just did or whatever, and go, "Man, I just was in the yeah, ring." You with... get to you got to referee for Jim Crockett promotion. I did, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I got to re- yeah, and I got to be standing there next to Flair while he's about to go out for his last match, you know, and and uh, got to be produced by. You know, um, you know, Road Dog and and um, Tom Pritchard and you know and Scott Armstrong. You know, uh, people that you just never, that never thought that I would be. You know, uh, and, and now they're we have phone numbers, we talk, we share, we we follow each other on Twitter. We you know all these different yeah. things. So it, it's cool. These um, I don't these, I don't really know Tom that well, but the Armstrongs, the whole family, super guys. Uh, I'm great. so sad that Brad passed away so early. Brad was. I don't know if you've heard this before. Anybody that was around in that era will tell you probably one of the best hands in the business. Uh, I've and, heard and, that. I've heard that many times. Yeah, he's better uh, than you know, all of you them. Know, I, I would. I would say you know, like almost compare him to Bobby uh, Eaton, uh, as you know, could work with anybody, any style. Um, and the thing was, he wasn't super great at promos because he really didn't get a lot of opportunities. He wasn't bad at it, but he didn't shine on it. But he mm-hmm. was hilarious backstage, and all those all, all those Armstrong kids are hilarious. But, but Brian, uh, Brad was really funny. And uh, like people will never know that Dean Malenko is like has the driest sense of humor with the one liners. Dean Malenko is always so serious. But in the back, if you're driving with him or hanging with him, Dean Malenko is one of the funniest guys in the business. Who would ever know? Um, Same with Lance so, Storm. Uh, Lance Storm is like that too. Lance Storm is very funny. Yeah, but not nothing compared to Brad and, and Dean. Nothing against Lance. I love those. But, uh, not even close to Brad and Dean. No, but I'm just I saying, like, he's just super funny, and you would never yeah. you'd never think that, you know? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, uh, God, I kind of got, got off. Uh, what are we talking about now? The Armstrongs. All the, uh, All the things Armstrongs. you get to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, so, it was so much fun to see them. I, I, I actually drove in the car from the StarCast autograph signing to the uh, Flair's last match uh, building, the Nashville, Nashville Municipal Auditorium. I copped a ride with them and we got a little time to catch up. And then they came to one of our impact shows, what spent the weekend hanging out with those guys. Yeah. I, I go back to 91 with those guys. I mean, Man. Brian, Brian uh, was just a, a young kid back from uh, fighting the war in Iraq. Wow. It, it, I love, I love it. He listened to his podcast. Cause he, uh, Brian, he is just so entertaining. So funny. Uh, oh, and he was a, all those, all those Armstrongs are like that. They're all yeah. hilarious. Yeah. And Bob, I mean, I didn't really know Bob all that well, but Bob, nobody has a bad word to say about Bob Armstrong. In this business, even people that are well liked, somebody will, you can find somebody who says a bad word about you, especially when you're a promoter and a booker for so many years in the territories. You, you're liable to piss somebody off. Bob right. got pissed off, so God bless him. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So, um, real quick, that we're gonna wrap it up here. I just want to kind of um, take a moment. First of all, thank you again, Pinzer, for coming on. Uh, appreciate thank you for having me. It's an honor. Um, and uh, you know, we um, 
we always plug Impact on here, obviously, because me being a referee, we plug every. You know, we, we do talk about other products too, as well. But Impact, you can watch Overdrive. It's going to be live on Fight, also on Impact Plus or Impact Ultimate In- Insiders. Um, and then that ult- I got to say that Ultimate Insiders is a really cool deal. Yeah. If you're, if you're, if you're a fan of Impact and you don't get access TV or you're traveling or something like that, I think it's ninety nine cents. You could um you could Watch Impact commercial free at like eight thirty, starting on Thursdays on your phone or on your tablet. I'll yeah. probably watch Impact tomorrow night on my tablet when I get into the because I don't know if they, I don't think the, they don't usually have it in hotel room uh, access. So um so I I still I I did the four ninety nine to uh to uh watch the uh watch uh, uh Artichoke watch special, yeah to watch Artichoke but uh. I kept it because I was going to cancel, and I kept it because it's a super cool little thing to have, and it's cheap. So yeah. um, uh, if you're an Impact fan and maybe you travel a lot or you don't get a- access a lot, uh, I would suggest uh, checking out the Ultimate Insider's YouTube page for Impact Wrestling. Absolutely. Or, and then you can always go to the Impact Plus app, too, as well, but it's a little more expensive, but you do get uh, all, the, all the history that comes with it and all the other stuff. But the yeah, Ultimate Insider's, don't. you get that, too. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, and then of course, if you're in the area, you can, tickets are still available at the Paris Town Hall, uh, Old Forces Paris Town Hall, come check it out, Overdrive and Kentucky Chaos, uh, but you can always watch it on pay-per-view or go back and watch all the shows. Uh, we got Russellcade coming up, Pins, I know you promoted that, you'll be at Russellcade there. Will you be doing signings as well, or just appearances? I don't think so. I'm, okay. I'm, I'll be, I'm happy to, but I don't know, nobody said anything to me, I'm happy to do it if they want me to do it. All right. Well, we um, now you can listen to your show right now until you restart it back up on ad free shows, as you mentioned before. All the old interviews you have on there, um, you can listen to this show anywhere you get podcasts. Uh, download Apple Podcasts, Google Google Play, Stitcher Radio. And I, and right I got away. a couple of thi- I got a couple of things in the works. So. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, okay. so stay tuned. Uh, stay you might tuned. be able to find me on a podcast or two uh, down the road. Uh, working on. I'm, I'm almost finished one project. It's a short form. Uh, six week, six episodes, and um, and then I'm working on a, 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 a podcast that has uh, nothing really to do with professional wrestling, other than um, uh, it's going to be focused on with a wrestling theme, guests and stuff, but focus on mental health. Oh, nice! I like that. That's oh, okay. Because I've I battled I battled anxiety, anxiety and panic attacks since I was uh, 18 years old, uh, huh. almost 40 almost 40 years, and I'm very open about it. And because um, I want to be, be able to try to help others who don't do it. And the more people feel comfortable talking about it, not to go off on another change, tangent, because I know you got to go. But the more people feel comfortable talking about it, the more people you realize are really suffering. Right. There's, more, there's people that, are, that were suffering in silence that aren't in silence anymore. Because they, they could go on Twitter or Facebook and, 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 and they could, you know. So I decided to start a podcast. I'm going to have a co-host who... Um, has wrestling ties and also suffers from um, uh, major anxiety depression, and uh, we just want to we want to make sure that people know it's okay not to be okay, uh, and there's a path forward if you're suffering. So uh, if you're looking for that, it's not going to come. It'll probably take a couple few months. It's right in the development stages, but um, we're going to get it out there, and I, I'm looking forward to, uh, to 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 doing it and seeing how how I can be a help to people who are suffering and anybody. And I'm sure you'll you'll put that up when it's available on your on your Twitter, which is at David Penzer, correct? Yeah, yeah. Come join me on my Twitter at David Penzer. I don't talk politics. Uh, a little fantasy football, raise baseball sometimes, mostly wrestling. Yeah, and uh, it's a, it's a good follow for sure. Uh, follow him at David Penzer. Um, you can get us on the social media at uh, at the Twitter, the Instagram, and the Facebook at Ringside Podcast. Individually on Twitter and Instagram, I'm at Daniel Spencer. I'm at Jeremy underscore CSZ. And I'm at Linda K. 22. All right. Again, David, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Uh, I think it's the first time I've ever called you David. I always call you Penzer. Uh, Everybody <laughs> always calls me Penzer, and they call my kid Penzer, and at work they call my wife Penzer. I, it's just one of those names that it's like come, rolls off your it's mouth. Like, it was like Spencer. I mean, I, I hardly get called Daniel. I get called Spencer. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Same thing. No, it's true. It's yeah. Right. Show him some respect, Spencer. Yeah, yeah. Hey, <laughs> I always say I don't care what you call me, what you call me as long as you call me. Exactly. There you go. That's it. That's it. But again, thank you for so much for coming on. Appreciate it. Uh, great, Honor. great stories. I'm looking forward to that future podcast, and I look forward to seeing you in a couple of days, and uh, or actually tomorrow, but uh, definitely over the weekend. Even though uh, I'm home, I'm still gonna maybe have a drink or two with you for sure. All right, buddy. Look forward to it, and look forward to seeing the fans in Louisville, and then uh, 
And then WrestleCade, Winston-Salem. And then I'm doing a standalone wrestling show in uh, New Jersey. Uh, you might want to check out. It's called Standalone Wrestling. I'm actually doing a seminar uh, and ring announcing. And uh, the first seminar I've ever done on ring announcing. So that'll be interesting. And um, doing, uh, and then we'll be in Fort Lauderdale for, to wrap up the, the the year for Impact. So uh, we'll, we'll make sure forward. we'll make sure to tweet that out and get that get those plugs out first, there for sure. On first that, time, uh, first time since 2000 that I've done four week. Uh, no, since 1998 that I've done four weekends in a row on the road for wrestling. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Well, again, thank you so much. We're always sitting ringside with David Penzer. There you and go. Uh, and uh, as in the meantime, but between time until next time with us, you can catch us ringside. All right. See ya.